I'm in my own lane, trying to handle business. I'm just out here trying to get it. I'm just out here trying to get it. Me and my team trying to get it. Get some money, then flip it. Then flip it. All right, welcome to Mars World Radio. We got Mr. Eric Fontaine, man. How you doing? Man, what's good, y'all? Like, I, I feel really good to be sitting right here right now. Uh, Marv, man, man, him go way back, bro. Me and you go way back. Like, I think you was the first or the second person when I started painting that was like, yo, like, you want to sit down and talk. You were working with somebody else. Um, but you, yeah, yeah, yep, yeah, you know what I mean. Like, back in the basement days, back way back, you feel me? So I really do appreciate another opportunity to sit down, man. You know I'm, I mean? I'm glad you're one of the first ones to come back, new style of interview yeah. type thing. Yo, a good big spot in, nice. the, in the HQ, new yeah, HQ, man, first I one like in the HQ it. for I the like interview. It. Make it moves, baby. Absolutely, man. So how, how's life been for you, man? What's, uh, what's new since we like we last talked in 2014. I have none of those interviews either. That's crazy. I think it was like 2014 or 15. I have none of those and interviews. I had just, I was what, about, I say about six to one year into painting. Like I just started painting that year before, just randomly. Something was like, I don't know if it was like the spirits or something. Like, yo, Eric, just start painting one day. And you were one of the first persons like, um, to be like, yo, holla at me. And so I was a rookie back then. I'm about seven years in the game now. The way I look at it, um, for artists, just like NBA players, just like, you know, musicians, just like, you know, just certain fields, you have your your peak, your prime, your early. And so I'm thinking I'm reaching that that level of, you know, being at the 10-year mark. Once You know, about two years from now, I'll be at the 10-year mark. And... I really feel like a professional. I really feel like I've expanded the way I paint and just grasped it more than what I was like those years back, man. That's dope, man. So now, with so I, with that being said, I know you did a, a show after we last talked. You did uh, not show, but um, maybe like a call a gallery or a display. Yeah, um, art case. Yeah. Art, yeah, art case. Yeah, you did one of those. How did that? How did that turn out for you? How did that work? How did you even maneuver that? I should first. Man, time? so. Uh, just, you know, just to keep it, you know, 100, like, most of my art and the shows that took place from then to now has been me searching or me running into it or somebody reaching out. Mm -hmm. The first one at the public library, that was just a random, I, I used to go to the library all the time, I like to read, so I was going to the library and I seen that they had, you know, paintings and different, like, artists doing stuff in the glass case, so I approached them and they was like, hey, yeah, let's check you out. And that's when the newspaper wrote about me when I did my first show there than the next so it was just like people you know giving me like hey Eric you might want to look into this or somebody just randomly emailing me saying hey like we seen your paintings on Instagram or we seen that somebody wanted to share your art with us do you want to submit a painting so it's just all like it just happens I can't even it's just one of those things where sometimes it falls out the sky sometimes you really got to go hard and look for it because as an artist shit ain't gonna just come to you yeah it ain't gonna come to you so you have to if you want to stay consistent and stay relevant you have to either be reaching out and also people reaching out to you it's vice versa okay so before we go forward i want to take people back i want to give them a little story a little history about you um like where you were born where you come from things of that nature because i don't think you're from niagara falls right nah okay i think you last time you said we were you were from texas yeah so i, I was born in philly that's where, like, my birth certificate, Social Security, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Um, but I was raised in Texas. So, yes, I was born in Philly. But at any time somebody asks where I'm from, I'm from Texas. Houston, Texas, baby, the H. Um, that bred me. That that changed my whole perception of the South. That, that really, like, ingrained who I am today. It's a mix between some of the uh, e Northeast culture and some of the south culture just intertwined and it made me who i am so yeah anytime somebody asks me i'm from the age baby so how long how old were you when you when you moved to houston i was i say about nine years old okay so you still adolescent yeah so i'm like no teenager type of thing yeah no teenager i was just at you know elementary schools like that in the suburbs nice area stuff like that so you do you you remember okay. philly and then you remember you yeah, soccer and philly like doing just you know what I mean? Soccer, reading, a lot of just suburban type lifestyle <laughs> stuff, man. <laughs> man, 
Magic Treehouse books. Like, it, it was a... I will say it was a good part of my life where, you know, Philly played a factor in how I talk and, you know, just... It, it's, it's different. It's so it was a big change of pace going from Philly to Houston? Oh, man. Yeah. It was a big pace. Like, just the fact that people could tell... I was not from the South, man. I, the way I talked, the way me and my siblings talk, I had to change. Like how we ate, my mom had to, you know, change how we address people. Yes, ma'am. No, ma'am. Yes, sir. No, sir. We had to literally leave, not leave what we knew in the North, but adapt and change. And mm -hmm. it worked out perfectly. I will say the Southern lifestyle um, played a big part of how I look at people, how... I approach things, so yeah. So how often do you go back to either place, like Philly or... Uh, Philly, I've been going to Philly a lot. Like, over the last couple of years, I've been... Like, Houston has been quite some time. Yeah. I'm not even going to front on that some time. Um, I'm not going to even BS. I'm afraid of planes, like, <laughs> flying and stuff like that. So I got to get over that. But uh, Philly, I love Philly. I got my dad's side of family in Philly. So I'm, you know, always talking to my sister on stuff like that. I like the Philadelphia culture as well. Uh, it's just a different vibe. So Philly, I've been going to because I had a couple sales out of New York, a couple sales in Philly. So it just, it all, it all depends on where my art is taking me to. Yeah. You know what I mean? So when you, so I, I want to speak on Philly. So you, you go to, I'm assuming you drive your, it's only like a six hour drive. I do not drive, I take Amtrak, baby. Oh, you take Amtrak? Is yeah. it the same amount of time? Amtrak, it's about seven hours. Seven hours? So just maybe, but it does a pit stop in uh, New York City, yeah. which I love. I love the pit stop. You get about an hour, maybe two, sometimes two and a half. And so when I'm at Penn Station, I, I carry light, I pack light, I travel light. So I'm either hitting up, you know, a food spot, taking pictures. So it's a good little stop gap. Okay. You know what I mean? Just to, you know, to get the scenery of the New York City vibe. Yeah, because they like an hour apart or something like that. You can yeah, look, drive yeah. to like Manhattan. And like people confuse <laughs> New York City because they think like it's the city is all the boroughs plus Manhattan. Yeah. But it's just Manhattan and the boroughs are a separate entity. So like, right. you can get from Niagara Falls to Manhattan in six hours. Mm -hmm. And you can get from Niagara Falls to Philly in six hours. It's crazy, bro, because yeah. When I'm in New York City, it takes 45 minutes from New York City to Philly. See? But it takes six hours from Niagara Falls, which is in New York State, to New York City. So, yeah. Because yeah, I, drive, I drive there. I drive, I drove to New York City right. a few times. Okay. And I just went to Philly uh, when I went to go see the Sixers play. I was going to go back this year, but the COVID happened. So, we were, we were going to go back. We were supposed to go back last year in the beginning of the season to watch my Sixers play. But I'm like, ah, oh, let's just wait until a little later because then we can bring the kids. And then COVID hit. I'm like, look at this stupid man, shit. Right COVID here. had to train on. They gave me my own car, man. Did they? Man, like, the, you know what I mean? Like, I got OCD type, you know what I mean? So you cough too many times around me. I might, yo, you good? You feel me? Right now, during the pandemic. <laughs> <laughs> so, like, there was these, uh, you know, the individuals walking by. And I was somewhat in the back. I wanted to sit near the food car just in case. I like to sit with my back again, so I don't want nobody feet against me, stuff like that. So I had a good spot, but I'm near the food cart and people get hungry. And they walking back and forth, dude. <clears throat> yeah, you know, I let the first one go. Now you walking with your family. Now both of y'all coughing. I didn't even think twice. I got up, and this was maybe about like an hour away from um, Niagara Falls, you know. So it was getting towards the tail end of the trip. These people had just got on. And so I just went up to the one guy up in the food car. I was like, yeah, man, they coughing and stuff, walking back and forth. <laughs> like, can I sit somewhere? I'm about to move. He said, there's an empty car in the front. You can take that one by yourself. Man, I hot-tailed up out of there so quick. I don't play about that, man. Yeah. So when you're traveling, such as airplanes, trains, crew, man, cruises, they got locked down on ports. I felt bad for them and shit. Yeah. But you have to be smart, man. You have yeah. to be smart. And the COVID... Have New York City looking so different when I stopped in Penn Station because I've been going consistently over the last couple of years. When I'm first going, man, busy everybody. You seeing people on like uh, electric bikes, scooters, everything. But I seen somebody sitting on a suitcase scooter. She's on a suitcase, sitting on a suitcase while she's scooting around. Crazy shit. Now, empty. It's a ghost town. People went home. Man, they wasn't about to pay that rent to not do nothing. They was there. To, they was there to create a dream. Marv, 
you know empty. What I mean? Empty, bro. See, I haven't been down there yet. I'm, oh, I'm kind of nervous. Like they got, they got hit the hardest. One of my mans, he went. Um, shout out to Sambino. He went and he made a video. He showed. Man, there was like a thousand people up in that. What is that Central Park or something? Yeah, he said he wasn't even in the full. He just was in a portion of Central Park. I seen people with no masks throwing fris frisbees, dogs running around. I'm like, he's like, yeah, these people don't care. So it's just one of those things where you got to be safe. And he was safe, you know what I mean? So Central yeah. Park, like 52 blocks long. Yeah, he was telling me, like, hey, man, I ain't even been over it. I'm like, I'm already hot, you know? <laughs> it's a lot of walking, you know? So yeah, I got to get you. there. Hopefully when the pandemic clears up, you know, when things... But I'm being honest and transparent with people. I don't see it clearing up until 2021. Oh, yeah. I don't think it's coming until April. Yeah. yeah. yeah I, I totally agree. agree with you on that. I, I thought they was going to try and, like, ebb it out by, you know, election. First, I was like, oh, this should be over by May. And I was like, ah, by July, it should be good. Fourth of July, ain't nobody going to be in this. And I'm like, oh, okay. Looks like we're going to be holding on a little longer. We're going into 2021 with this, man. Oh, yeah. And I try to be a realist. You know, I don't want to be the, the, the uh, downer of the party, but I'd rather be transparent. You know, without transparency, people are living in a false reality, the severity of the situation. They don't. And that's unfortunate because it's like, I do think the virus is real. Um, I do think there was a political thing behind the pandemic too. Because um, the recovery rate, like 95% plus, something like that. Mm -hmm. So it's like, you still don't want nobody to die. But something's not adding up. Like, you know, I think it's just, it's something else beyond just COVID, just the vaccines, just the pandemic. I think it's something bigger brewing behind yeah, it. You, you I'm, it. I'm one of those little conspiracy theories. I think oh, something else yeah. cooking up. I'm like, this is crazy. I mean, more like we, we never shut down for stuff for this type of recovery rate. The mortality we, rate is too we low for shut down. Uh, bird flu, swine flu, Zika virus, Ebola bounced back, mm -hmm. H1N1, M1N1. Like all type. We don't have so much different stuff over the year that this came at a, like you said, I, I'm not on the conspiracy level, but I do agree that it just came at an inopportune moment. During election, Trump talking about, yeah, if you know, I'm not voting for a stimulus package until I'm after I'm like to try to put people against the wall. They're using this. And, um, as far as the debate, they actually, like Biden said, as a president, he done had all these people die. Mm -hmm. but it's like, even whether it's his fault or not, it still happened while he was president. You get blamed yeah. for everything that happens under your presidency. 9-11 yeah. is Bush fault. Yeah. Even though it was, he had no clue what the fuck was going Even on in the CIA. Yeah, like, yeah, they yeah, they yeah. proved and they got their, you know, theories that, you know, it was an inside job. You could look in and, you know, I'm one of those people leaning that it was possibly an inside job. But the COVID, I don't know where I'm at. I'm in the middle. I know the, the virus is real. People, oh, yeah, I know people, sick. You know, I know yeah. that for sure. But as far as anything beyond that, um, we won't know until maybe a year or two after, bro, until it clears up. If it, but right now they're talking that. We need to learn how to live with it. Yeah, when all those documentaries come out, like, hey, this is what really happened during COVID. They were stealing money. And you know what I mean? It's one of those where they're saying, this ain't going away. Oh, yeah. And it's a new reality that we have to adjust to. It's going to be added to the, the flu vaccines. You know how people go get their shots, kids yeah. get their shots and stuff like that? They just waited on an actual vaccine that's going to work. And then once that vaccine works, it's all, you know, it's all bombs away from there. You taking a vaccine? Hell, I took the flu shot. The last time I took the flu shot, I was probably about twenty-one, and every I don't take it every no no time, and I have not been sick. You know, I took it last year, but that was the first time I took it in about six years. Yeah, cause I had a newborn. Okay, so I, had that's a totally I, was, I don't want to bring a newborn totally in. Totally understand. He, he was born middle. We knew he was gonna be born during flu season. I was like, I don't want to bring a newborn in. I just don't want to take the chance. I respect it, bro. I respect it. Because I'm one of people. I'm like, if you get the flu shot and I don't, you should be safe. If I even if I catch the flu, you should be safe because you got the flu shot. If you yeah. believe in it so much, so people usually leave me alone about it, but. In this particular case, I'm like, he's not going to be eligible to get any of those kind of shots. Yeah, man. He's going to have a raw immune system. And, and if you want to come by around my kid, there's really no debate about it. Like, yeah. If you ain't got no shot, you, you ain't come. I can send you a picture. Yeah, he's been cooped up in the house uh, his whole first He's a year old now. He's been cooped up in the house pretty much the whole year. But I look at it like if this shit continues for another year or so, 
like I feel bad for some of the college students. You know, if you're oh. a freshman, you're 18, 19, and you want to leave home, you want to be an adult. <laughs> Your, uh, this is your first time, or you may be coming from a bad home and you mm -hmm. got a full ride scholarship to one of the most, maybe the most prestigious, maybe just a good four year college. They're like, yeah, you could come, come. And now your reality is you're showing up to a college where you might get sick or you might be quarantined to a room. Like, as mm -hmm. I got past that stage of partying and experiencing, you know, all those off campus, on campus, so I, that window has long gone for me but I do feel that you know somebody that's 19 20 um, should be able to experience that college life to true college essence but some of them are trying to do that and it's not working out colleges are saying yeah we got high high cases people are doing off fraternity you know off campus fraternity parties and stuff like that so it's just a weird moment in history. This will be a history books. We will be talking about it 10, 15 years from now. Oh, yeah. They're not gonna, it's not, the kids aren't going to stop until one of them die. But, you know what I mean? It's, the chances of that is slim. So, they're like, they know that they, <laughs> they got their parents telling them, like, oh, man. hey, this is only going to affect old people and people who have a bad he immune system. He said it on the, the debate. You heard that part, yeah, right? Yeah. Like, he was like... Uh, Trump, he was like, yeah, you know, 95% recovery rate. And then the uh, Biden rebuttal was like, you know, teachers, you heard what he said. You know, not all of you guys are going to die, just some of you. Pretty yeah. much saying that, yeah, the kids, y'all might bounce back good as hell, but your teacher's in their 60s. Your yeah. filthy 50s or something. We may lose some of them. It was sarcasm behind that statement. Oh, yeah, that was the, he was definitely being sarcastic. People took like he was to it. You know what I mean? There was a little truth to it because some teachers are saying, like, the older ones are being forced into retirement. You know what I'm saying? Like, look, there's we're going virtual. Some schools are just now trying trying to transition into just virtual. Yeah. Like, this is going to be the new, the new schooling. So it's just weird. I don't have kids, so... It's not affecting me on the, the kid standard as far as my household, but I do have a little sister. And I want my little sister to succeed. I want my little sister to interact with other kids. I want, like, it's no, I don't think you're really, at this age, like, there's a year as far as from this year to this year where kids need to be around other kids because they get social skills. I want that for, like, other kids. I want that, man. But I also want them to be safe. Yeah, yeah. So it, it just won't all come down to safety. Yeah. So now I want to I want to talk about Houston. Um, you, you're nine years old. You get to Houston. Um, culture shock. I'm sure you probably started seeing wood grain, big rims, whole lot of weed. Uh, <laughs> hot as hell. <laughs> oh man, like this this hair. I wouldn't have that if I was still in the age. This I would. I probably like have a fade, taper fade with some waves. You know, waters and stuff like that, honeycomb type hairstyle. <laughs> but uh, yes, uh, when I got into intermediate school, uh, which is like Ooh, yeah. fifth and sixth grade, then you get to middle school, seventh and eighth, and then you get to high school, ninth through twelve. Oh, I didn't know they break it down like that. Yeah, so they have elementary, which is from uh, first grade to fourth. They have the pre-K, then they have the intermediate, which is fifth and sixth, middle school, sixth and seventh, then the high school. That's a good transition, actually. They need to do that. It was awesome. Yeah, because yeah, because there's no way a, a fifth and sixth grader need to be with a, a bunch of kids. Seventh and eighth, and, ninth and they don't graders. need to be with seventh and eighth graders either. Like, yeah. you know what I, mean? I I grew up in um like the shit that people see on TV was some of like that the bonfire lakes bayous type you know football Friday nights beer. That was how it was, man. It so that's was, a real thing. That's not just a fantasy world. No, it, it's hot as shit. Yes, granted. Like, summers were brutal, but just the experience having, like, I went to school where everybody, like, the sixth and the, the fifth and sixth, they transitioned to seventh and eighth. So, I seen the same people all the way from fifth grade to eleventh grade, junior year, and then we moved. But, um, yeah, like, just that culture, the wood grain, yes, in the hoods and stuff, third ward, fifth ward. Um, you know, TS, uh, yeah, TSU, or when you start going like down there in the wards and stuff like that, that's when it gets hood. Uh, wood grain pop trunk, <laughs> uh, elbows, 20 inch rims. Yes, that is the like the Houston Southern, um, not mentality because everybody doesn't do that, but that is something like in the African American and Hispanic community, Mexican community as well, you know what I mean? Like they have their essence 
So that that hood essence, depending on where you lived at, you will see it. And there wasn't one of those things where you would be bothered. I wasn't really bothered unless somebody like called me out my name and then, you know, then I'm bothering them back. That's when it's, you know, mutual. We, we fist fight. It wasn't all that shooting. You know, even though gun laws are lax as hell back in the day. It's open carry in Texas. <laughs> yeah, now it's open carry. People walk in grocery stores, you see the pistol on the side. Back in the day, it was none. Like, you fought at the back gate, and you probably see that same person at the football game, and y'all fighting against the other team's school. You know ah, what okay. I mean? Like, this one of those things where you didn't hold on. You know, there, there were still games. There were still, you know, Crips. There were still GDs, True Top Pie Roos, um, you know, Brown Prize, stuff like that. But, you know, the skaters, it was preps, it was cheerleaders, that the grassy type shit that you used to see on TV, the, the old school, t it was similar to the school I went to because it was multicultural. It was like white, black, Mexican. It wasn't just, you know, I did go to a hood school. Uh, I got caught living out of district. My mom moved. And if you get caught living out of district, it's different up here. You could live out of district and go to a certain school on the other side of town, some crazy up north. Down south, didn't work like that. If you live out of district, you go to that school where you live at. Like, so I had to go to NB Smiley, one of the hooded schools in Houston. Um, up, yeah, I would say that with Forest Brook, and there's another school. And Smiley though was probably, and that was the fucked up part about being caught. I think somebody snitched. Um, like, I got in a fight a month or so ago prior to getting caught and I think dude retaliated by snitching like yo Eric stays out of the district get a letter my mom has to transfer me to NB Smile. I went there for three months until she moved back in district that school was hood as fuck uh, I wasn't smoking weed at that time I was a freshman when I got caught and my first experience going into Smiley High School was going into the restroom. I had to use the restroom. Like, I'm nervous as shit. Like, I knew nobody. I imagine I was going to school 5th, 6th, 7th, and 8th with the same people. And then freshman year, you get caught, you got to go to the hooded school that your school used to play football against and used to kick their ass. Like, my school was kicking Smiley at homecoming every fucking year. And then there was a fight. So I get caught. I go to the school. I know nobody. But the small little people, you know, small group of people that I knew in that neighborhood that I got caught at. And I walk in the restroom and I, I walked into a smoke box, man. I wasn't smoking weed at that time. And so when I walked in, I can't go back out. Like the door already, and it's packed. There's, there's dude, like these are seniors and juniors lined up on both sides of the fucking wall. I'll never forget this. Both sides of the wall, that was like... And my first response is, no, I don't smoke. And I still had some of the proper accent, you know what I mean? Still a little bit of residual. They was like, um, well, you got to get the fuck up out of here. I ain't think twice, you know what I mean? I got the fuck up out of here. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> I thought you were going to say I fucked somebody. You know, I ain't think twice, man. And so, and then another experience, like they had, um, you know, how cops ride bikes in cities, like the bicycles. Yeah. Just not not no more. That just the regular actual pedal bikes. Yeah. yeah, they rode that in the hallways, like in the hallways. Like there's people used to man. We had the uh, rap click called the retarded click. Them niggas, <laughs> them niggas was crazy than the motherfucker. So yeah, I got in one fight at that school. And then turn um, you, you win some, you lose some. That was more of a draw because that nigga came back deep. I wasn't no pussy, so I didn't back down. They started crowding up. Like, everybody, you got the females there. You're like, oh, shit, I'm new. the new guy about to get in a fight. And then I see all these niggas. I'm like, y'all, y'all ain't about to. I'm glad cameras wasn't back then because the motherfuckers would try to jump me, and then I would end up on World Star. I would say, yeah, the World Star. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, that was the wood gray syrup lean. That That's true. Um, the lean purple double cup. Stuff like that with the Sprite. Back then it was Sprite Remix. You know what I mean? I don't even think people still remember what Sprite remember Remix that. was. <laughs> had a quick summer run. Um, so that's, that's true. Uh, I'm not going to say that was the best moment in my life, but I did I did try lean, and it put me to fuck to sleep. I did not get to experience with all the other people that, yeah, man, I partied off. Nah, I ended up going to sleep watching Scarface. So, you know what I mean? The, 
the culture is real. Barbecue, real. Horses, niggas in the hoods, you might like. So when I moved up here or moved like go certain places, I'm like I'm from Houston. Do y'all ride horses? I don't ride no fucking horse. I, the horse is like that's a big ass animal. You know what I mean? <laughs> if you don't know what the fuck you're doing, you will get hurt and you will get injured. But people will assume like everybody had fucking horses down there. Granted, niggas did have horses in the hood. You will run into a plot or a, some like a person <laughs> has a house and they own the, like the little plot beside them. They got like a little man made barn and shit. Nigga got a horse, or you might be in your car. And this is back in 2005 type shit, 2006, man. You try, yo, watch out, dude on the horse. It's regular. It's regular. It's not, yo, he's on the fuck. It's just every now and then you will run into somebody that has a horse. So, like, 05, 06 was the epitome of, of Houston music scene. That's Slim Thug. That's Paul Wall from, like, Mike Jones. Oh, 03 to uh, oh, like Mike eight, Jones, eight, oh, nine. Chameleon yeah, Mike Jones, there. Chameleon there. That's the um, Chopped and Screw era came. Went national. I don't want to say it came up because it was already booming in Houston. But it went national around that time. So, like, what was the energy like in Houston? Do you remember that feeling? Zero, man. Um, zero. I know some of my Houstonian fans that are on Facebook are going to say this and, then, and see this. And if they did not hear me say zero... Me and my introduction, I would be fake about it. Zero is not known like a Paul Wall. He's not, unless you're from Houston. Where oh, you're Zero from. is a person. And zero is oh, a okay, okay. Like yeah. Benny the Butcher. Yeah. Buffalo. Like, like, shout out to Buffalo and Buffalo Kids thing. Like, you know, y'all going in. Benny the Butcher, if I'm not from this area, if I'm deep in Houston and you told me who a Benny the Butcher is back in Texas, I'd probably be like, who is that? But. Everybody in Buffalo knows. That's similar to what a zero is, but he's been doing this shit for like 20 plus years. So, zero, trade of truth, chameleon there, Mike Jones, Paul Wall, Slim Thug, the boys in blue. You know what I mean? That was popping, bro. Like the big T's. <laughs> Get them long the Big T's. T shirts, man, with the starch dickies or the. The Jabos and stuff like that with the forces. You know, they had every type of Air Force One, man. Mm -hmm. Like, even the hood spot, you're going to see some shit that you think, yo, that's ill. That's fake than a motherfucker, bro. But you know what? It go with the fist. <laughs> <laughs> it go with the fist. I'm crazy. It was at the peak. Houston had, like, right now, Atlanta's at its peak. It's been at its peak for a while. Hell yeah. That's Buffalo, cool, like, bro. the East Coast has had New York on it. Uh, you know, uh, ASAP Rocky, uh, Joey Badass, they had like New York or like their peaks a couple years ago. Now Buffalo bouncing back hard with Benny the Butcher, Conway, and 38 Special. West Side Gun. West Side Gun. 38 Special from Rochester. Okay, my bad. I know they'd be collaborating. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, definitely. like so they're having their resurgence or something. Houston had their peak, oh, excuse me, back then. And it was amazing. I got to experience that. I got to really fall into that the the big t-shirts man i don't know what the fuck i was thinking like, oh man we was doing that shit too yeah like, it, it was, was crazy a, man fat, that was a you know laffy taffy area yeah like, it was, and so I, I loved it i loved everything about mike jones he had his run he was really popping and then he fell off the map yeah. people that still consistent down there is like that that hood love hood rap trader troop zero slim thug you know what I mean? They'll never, they'll never not have a spot where Houston knows and show them love. Hey, Travis yeah. Scott from Houston, man. Travis Scott too, man. Like hey, Travis Scott. Yo, that I was up here when he really blew up. And yeah. His sound was different. Oh yeah, that's what I'm saying. When I heard he was from Houston, I'm like what? He incorporated. He really found that that edge. He incorporated the Houstonian Southern. Like chop, because even some of the people that get featured on his shit, they mention Houston. They mention shit about Houston, chop and screw this and that. He put them on, and like so, he he found a bridge where that shit really worked for him. It really fucking worked for him, and so like he's really big. They you know he got the the, um, the which uh, one of the Kardashian he popped that Kylie, you know, yeah, he, he, the he, young one, the rich one. The, <laughs> The youngest rich one. He got he the, good. the one with the bag. Yeah, the kid good. He <laughs> yeah, good. Like, he got, got a bag, Travis man. fucking Scott day. And um, Astroworld. I cannot not mention Astroworld. Astroworld was a theme park. 
Um, I went there a couple times back in my teen days. Oh, so he got Astro World from a Houston thing. Yeah, Astro World was actual oh, thing. Oh, okay, I didn't know that. Yeah, so like it's been closed for so many years until he's young enough to know and remember Astro World and how how much of a. a a thing it latches onto Houstonians like yo you let's go to Astro World like it, you'll always be able to connect to a summer thinking of like back in old you know back in old three old four old you know old two like man fucking grease lightning uh, funnel cakes shit like that but now it's it's no more Astro World okay okay see I didn't know that I always wonder where I thought it was just like you know Travis Scott being Travis Scott yeah nah, nah it's, yeah. Astro. <laughs> okay, so now I know you said you got in the, um, into art uh, six months prior to when we, you and I have first spoke. Um, now, did these places throughout these journeys did it inspire you um, retrofittingly? Of course, did it inspire you in the art world? Like, have, have how have you taken those characteristics from Philly, from Houston, those experiences, and put that into your art? I would say. Being down south showed me to be humble about my art. Being in Philly, because that's, uh, I can still remember, like, that's just straight direct, just straight raw. There's no, you know, trying to, you know, be considerate of, is he going to take this the wrong way? So, you know, toughen you up. Um, being up here, because I've been here for about seven, going on eight years now, so I don't put it like a dec close to a decade up here. Show me that Niagara Falls is totally different. Um, it's not grimy, it's gritty. Yeah. Gritty. I will say it's, it's a small community, but being at all these places, and I lived in Long Beach, California for two years. Actually, uh, I still remember earthquakes and shit. That was way, way back. It was two years in Long Beach, Cali. Being all these places showed me that you have to be adaptable. So I started painting, the shit wasn't working. It was like, man, I was critiquing my own, like, this looks kind of ugly. Let me show somebody else. Eric, you probably want to work on this. You probably want to do that. Uh, you have to adjust. So then I had to adjust to something different. Man, nobody's noticing my art. Am I not good enough? Am I doing the right thing? Like, what am I missing? And then just staying consistent and learning. Like, if you can't stay consistent, that's where some people... Even myself, I had to understand that consistency is the most important key as much as effort. Because without effort, there's not going to be no consistency because you're not going to give a shit. Yeah. I wouldn't, if I'm not putting effort in one, do a painting once a month, I can't be consistent with 12 paintings a year. Mm -hmm. It goes one, you know, it goes hand in hand. So it showed me like I could adjust. I could adjust and I could, um, Expanded my art because I was doing one type of genre. Then I went to this genre. Then I was like, let me incorporate music. Now I'm doing podcasts and I'm blogging. But let me try to put all all of them together, all on one balanced playing field because you want to be consistent. Now, um, so what kind of art would you say would be your favorite? I know you um, you do the abstract art. Um, I actually still have the paintings you gave me too. Uh, Bro, you know what? And I I got to admit, I actually had all intentions on bringing you a motherfucking painting, man. Oh, man, that's good. I, I still I, so I'm, still gonna, I'm still going to give it to you. It'll be sometime next week. But I had all intentions when I was on the way. Like, get a dress and shit, grab his painting that... I'm like, bro, I rushed out so quick that I forgot, but you're gonna get it, bro. Yeah, I got a roll. I still got it in the um, the protector you gave me. Yeah, like man. you said, you had to roll up in the protector. I still got it in there because I was like, oh man, I can't. My wife done changed the painting, so I can't. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I had to roll, roll out of story. So like, like you do strictly abstract painting? Have you tried doing other uh, other type of painting, like a uh, portrait or anything like that? I can't do portrait. Like people have reached out to me to want to do like a. A commission portrait piece yeah but my specialty what i love what gives me like energy what gives me that that umph is abstract like i, I tell people when they because people have asked me to do a commission i have turned people down like over the years of not to the point where i could just turn everybody down because that would not be logical sense yeah. but i do turn people down because i've gotten somewhat to a level where 
I know I'm going to make it or, you know, I'm going to make my money so, I'm, you know, on another painting that I want to truly do. So, I, you know, I will politely say, yes, I can do a portrait, but that's not something I want to do. If you want an abstract portrait, just tell me the colors you want. But as far as telling me exactly this is what you want, it's not going to work that way. I'm not that type of artist. Like, you can't hover around me. You can't, yo, do this, do this. You tell me the colors, and that's it. You want a little bit of this, you want a little, that's it, and then let me just do my thing. Because if you try to be too over-the-shoulder type, I'm not going to feel it. So it's more of a feeling for you? Yeah. Okay. Now, I know a lot of people don't truly, or don't haven't, people that aren't into art, let me put it like that, um, or aren't fans of art, or don't follow art, don't truly understand abstract painting. So, like, how would you explain it to them? Not even just your abstract paintings, but just in general. Like, if somebody's like, yo, yeah, like, how would they, how would you describe the description of abstract? Because people have asked me, and I was like, man, what is it? Like, yeah, see? It? You know, you get that. Uh, and so some people are like, yo, I see this, this, and that, because they're familiar with what abstract is. Abstract is a form of free flow. It's a free flow movement of art within the person. I can't speak for everybody. But as far as what abstract is, you're just, you're unlocking a portion of your mind and you're going somewhere else where you're just free flowing with the paint. You want to throw this color, maybe it's going to bring out this edge or this corner. Sometimes the way I look at it, it's almost like space. Space is abstract. The space that we look up in the sky every night, you will see a constellation. You will see a star, but it's not it's not direct. It's just stars are everywhere. Space is at, it's just a black canvas with a lot of dots, white dots. It's abstract. It's, there's no direct form of what space is. And so that's why I try to say what abstract is. It's just all about free flow. Uh, it could be emotional. It may, if I'm doing a lot of dark abstract, I may be in an emotional point in my life where it might be dark. It might just not be perfect. A lot of bright colors and stuff. I might just be happy. Everything might be going good. If it's a, just a neutral, it just might. I just might just be feeling regular. So it's all about feeling and free flow, free movement, and just doing it. If that's the best, that's the best way I can put it, man. Because okay, <laughs> some In people, your words, yeah. yeah, some people see a painting and they be like, "Man, what do you see?" And I'm like, "What do you see?" And they'll sit there <laughs> and like look at it for. Man, I see a face. I see a. I see a man. I see a. I see this woman holding the baby. Is that a cry? I put. I will say that I do use a lot of um, religious symbolism. That's. I don't try to put like forefront. Like, damn, there's a big ass cross in my face. <laughs> but you will get halos and um, crosses and stuff like that. But if I tell you what I see, that's not. That's just tell. I'm just giving you what I'm feeling from what I created. Yeah. You're the you're the observer. I'm the creator. I want to. What do you see? And so that's always an awesome feeling when somebody sees like one painting, but five different people see five different things. As an artist, it makes you feel good because I didn't even see what you see, but you know what? Everybody looks at things in a different perspective, and that's how we got to just view the world as well. That's a fact. Now, what do you? How do you decide which paintings to keep and which ones to sell? Like, I got uh, this one big painting that any time people come over and they see him just because it's, it's a favorite. Like, to me, it's like my Elvis painting because he has like a like a swoop type. But it's a, it's a face. This is like, you can see his face. Big black painting. That I done held on for about five years now. Oh, wait. Probably had about 10 to 15 offers for people that see it. Not me posting it all the time because it's just it's like one of my favorite paintings. But the way I hold on and decide on which painting I'm gonna ki uh, keep is based off how I see value. Like the painting I've been holding on for five years, I've been offered like the most I've been offered for that painting was right around fifteen hundred, and I turned that down. Mm. I'm it's like, hold off. Yeah, I'm like I, I know it's gonna be worth more than that. Some paintings I just you know you want that one two fifty man I 
You know what I mean? It's like, I'm not going to hold on to that one. So I'm not just putting on my wall until I'm ready to sell it or somebody comes over or I'm just like showing like, cause I'm, you know, show my wall. Hey E, can I get that paint? Or like now that I'm doing a pod, I mean, I'm painting while being recorded. I'm doing that. People could see 15, 20 seconds of that painting and then they're like, yo, is that for sale or how much you want for that? So it all, like, six years ago, would this shit be going on? I don't even know, man. <laughs> maybe doubtful because I don't know if I would really be focused into it. You know, maybe the quick success wasn't having it quick enough. Yeah. Would I still be doing it? But the reason I paint, I like to do it. That's what I tell people all the time. I just like paying. It makes me feel good. Like, it's... It's cool to put them shits on the wall, you know what I mean, to look at my art. But it's even cooler to be doing it. Like, if this was just a black empty canvas or a white canvas, there was nothing on it. It was nothing. And now there's all these colors and all this this uh, visuals and just symbolism. It just it gives me an internal feeling, but a gratification from a sale also. Like, yeah. when I get a sale, that also feels good because now this person has something that they can keep forever. If you want to keep it and sell it, that's on you. But you you found something that I created was worth enough to be like, can I get that? Can I buy that? Can I, you know? And that's a good feeling because it's always one thing to create something. It's another thing to see what you create in another person's house. It's an awesome feeling. That's dope. So you like you go to people I was to visit and like how do you put the paint up? Well, I send paintings to like Texas, I send some to New York, I send some to Philly. I get a picture back. Like sometimes I'll just be like, you know, I I feel in a good mood. Hey, inbox me if you want a free painting. Oh wow. Some people bite that shit. And they really um they really jump on it. Like and some people that window closes, it's like I was doing that two months ago. I, and you could buy one. Oh man, this is it. I, you know. Do you only sell the one of one piece or do you do prints? One of one piece. That's one thing I like. I don't want copies. I don't want prints. Um, it's just one of those things where when I tell a person that they're going to buy a painting, it's one of one. Nobody has that exact painting. Nobody. I don't give a fuck if they seen an image and try to print it out or it's fake and then you get sued or some shit like that. But what you have on your wall that you can physically touch and you can physically feel the streaks. You're only touching the paint if you buy it, motherfucker. Not just like I'm hanging something up like, yo, E, get up. No, don't ever do that. But if you do buy a paint, it's yours. It's like it's now you can, nobody else is going to have that exact copy. I can't even read create the same exact copy it would not be possible because yeah. as an abstract artist i'm going to want it to be different from the original and then i would not it wouldn't make me feel good because it's like nah man nah, uh -uh. it's one of one no reprints uh, my man's that bought he got three and his uh his loft looks amazing with the three paintings i'm like bro it looks amazing you know what I mean? When I go into the house and I see empty walls, I'm looking at the wall like, yo, you could put a paint in here, you could put one here. And then if anybody comes here, the first thing they're probably going to notice, depending on how you set it up, yo, where you get that painting from? This ain't no Hobby Lobby. This ain't no Walmart bullshit. This ain't no $7.99 posters. This is one of a kind, man. And nobody else can say, I have that exact one. It's the best feeling in the world, man. Yeah, I can only imagine, man. Yeah. So, where can people find you? Where are your social medias? Should, are you on Twitter, Instagram? Where, where would you I'm tell just, people to find I'm, you? I'm now getting back on the Twitter. I fuck with Twitter hard body because I love Skip Bayless and I love Shannon Sharp and I just love Undisputed. Um, so, they're always on Twitter talking. Now, I'm just now getting back on the Twitter, but I prim primarily, I'm on Instagram. Fontaine the Painter, baby. Just... Fontaine, my last name, F-O-N-T-A-I-N-E, the T-H-E, painter. Y'all already got that. All one word, you're going to find me on Instagram. You're going to find me on two different blogs on WordPress. I got my blog where I do poetry as well. Um, this isn't no roses and red type poetry. It's more deep. Some of this shit is dark. 
some shit is bright. It's just introspective. Just, is what I would introspective. Say. It's just all how the fuck I'm feeling at the moment. So you can find my poetry at fontaine0522.wordpress.com. Yeah, yeah, sucky ass name. But my <laughs> art. This is what I really am leaning towards. I'm putting like I could have put my art on the same block, but that would have been too complicated. Fontaine the Painter Art Gallery dot WordPress dot com. Simple. That's where my paintings are going now. Digital art, stuff like that. You can view my paintings. Um, you can find me on Speaker. Uh, Good talks with EJ Fontaine. But I, I'm leaning into a direction, Marv. Like what you got going on. Kudos, bro. Thank you. Man. This Thank this you. like the interview setup, man. Nobody's doing what you're doing. Yeah, you know, I try and be different, you know? Pro. I want to bring a different experience to the to the area and, and grow it from there. It's proud to see it, but it's an honor to be on the first one, man. Like, it's, it's official. So, yeah, find me on Facebook if you want to dive into a little bit of my personal life, Eric J. Fontaine. I don't sugarcoat anything I say. I don't nitpick. I don't pick on people. I don't bash people. But I will be transparent on my posts. But, yeah. Follow me for my art, man. Fontaine the Painter on Instagram and my uh, blog, Fontaine the Painter Art Gallery dot WordPress dot com. All right, man. I appreciate you pulling up. I appreciate man, you being all good, you, baby. Man. It's all yo. Anytime. Last shout out because there's people in Houston that I fuck with. There's people in Niagara Falls I fuck with. Philly I fuck with. If you're doing something and you believe in it. No matter what anybody that's saying in your ear, tune them the fuck out. I don't listen to people, number one, if you're not even doing anything, <laughs> your critiques does not mean anything. So believe in your craft, believe in your skill. I am in Niagara Falls, so I'm going to give a shout out to some of the people that I do like listen to. Uh, Taiwan, Shooter, yo, your music official. AI, uh, Tuck, Turn Up King, Tuck. Your music is official. Go Green. Your music is official. BJ, yo, I see y'all back on y'all music. You know what I mean? Everybody that's doing something, please keep doing it. Fuck what everybody else is saying because you're going to have doubters. But it's always a good feeling to succeed in something that somebody else ain't doing, yo. That's it. All right, man. I appreciate you coming through, man. Oh, well, that's it. My sisters. Shout out to my sister Chelsea Porter and Lindsay So Chelsea, the glamour boss. She's selling a lot of women products. So if you, women want to holler at myself, my sister Chelsea Lynn on Facebook, she got a lot of female products. Now that's it, y'all. That's a good one. <laughs> all right, man. Mars World Radio. <laughs> Are you gonna get all that? I'm in my own lane, trying to handle business. I'm just out here trying to get it. I'm just out here trying to get it. Me and my team trying to get it. Get some money, then flip it. Then flip.